Um, hello, everyone. My name is Stefanie Spirovska. I'm from uh, Youth Educational Forum from um, Skopje, North Macedonia. And today, my role here will be the moderator of the discussion we have. And it's um, on a very interesting topic, I would say, uh, post-COVID or post-democracy Balkans. So today's focus will be on transitional justice and reconciliation after the pandemic. Um, what have we been doing so far? Uh, it's a group of young people uh, supported by the International Institute for Peace, Renner Institute, and the uh, Austrian Inter Institute sorry, for International Affairs. And we have been uh, supported to promote, promote sorry, our values, uh, to see what the next focus and what the next priorities of the Balkans should be. And we always come to one conclusion that being a young person in the Balkans or being someone who lives in the Balkans, it's always an adventure. It always brings new challenges and it's always something that we need to uh, build upon or work on. And it's um, more or less surprising every time. Uh, this group of people have been working together for um, more than a year, I would say two years approximately. And uh, we've been advocating so far for uh, faster EU integration of the Balkans. And now since our everyday life has changed, we started organizing this online discussion. Uh, we still have the focus on the democratic values, on the young people. And today we have three wonderful speakers who are going to share their experiences and their opinions and their um, views on how the things should continue uh, moving in the Balkans, I would say. So we have Alona Memeti, which is the executive director of Admovere uh, Pristina in Kosovo. We have Mario Majic, who is the uh, founding partner at Europe and Southeast in Petrinja, uh, Croatia, and program advisor at Peace Nexus Foundation in Switzerland, but he comes from Croatia originally. And we have Georgia Bojevic, who comes from uh, Belgrade originally, but is a student in London School of Economics. Uh, the three of them are young experts in their fields, and I always have pleasure spending time with them. Um, and I think that the questions we're going to open today are going to be interesting, are going to reflect on uh, what we're going through as people in the Balkans, and uh, where should we put our focus in the upcoming days. Without any further ado, I would like to give the virtual floor to Aldona Mameti and let her reflect to what have the recent democratic challenges have been in the um, in in her region or more specifically in um, Kosovo and to Pristina. So Aldona, the floor is yours. Feel free to uh, fit us with the information you have. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, it is very nice for me to be here with all of you, especially to share the floor, the virtual floor, obviously, with, um, with Mario, George, and with, with Stephanie. Uh, I would just like to give a very brief um, overview of the political situation of uh, what happened during the pandemic and what's happening now. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected democracy and transitional justice in the Balkans in various ways, I'd say. Um, in Kosovo, just two weeks after the first coronavirus case was confirmed, the Kosovo Prime Minister and Benkudis government was toppled after losing a non-confidence vote initiated by his coalition partner, the Democratic League of Kosovo, LDK. Um, the government was dismissed after over four months of coalition talks and, thus, uh, and, and less than one month after coming to power. The official narrative is that the government fell as a result of disputes over its approach to the COVID-19 pandemic. The ruling coalition LDK partners called for a state of emergency, uh, which in turn would give all the powers to President Hashim Pachi, um, and which is something that Kuti rejected, arguing that it would be unnecessary and set LDK's interior minister for spreading panic after he publicly supported Pachi's call for a state of emergency in one of the main um, um, TV stations. Also, it is important to stress that disagreements over the 100% tariffs on uh, Serbian imported goods further aggravated tensions, not only between coalition partners, but also between Putin and the international community. However, we can see a strengthening um, of nationalist rhetoric due to the COVID-19 pandemic, not only in Kosovo, but also in the region as well. And one of the main reasons uh, for this, I believe, are the upcoming elections uh, in the Western Balkans. For instance, the parliamentary and local elections that were just held in Serbia, elections in Montenegro, uh, early parliamentary elections in Northern Macedonia and local elections in Bosnia. And we all know the drill. Resorting to nationalist rhetoric and sentiments in election campaigns to divert attention from real problems. 
Another reason, oops, excuse me, this is not my phone. Just a second. Okay, so that's what happens when we go live. No problem. That's one of my colleagues. Um, yes, as I was saying, and we all know that we're resorting to nationalist rhetoric and sentiments in election campaigns to divert attention from real problems, such as, let's say, uh, employment, um, education, um, the judiciary, and so on. Another reason is Kosovo's president indictment for war crimes by the specialist chambers in The Hague. Uh, the representatives of Kosovo and Serbia were supposed to meet on the 27th of this month at the White House. However, Kosovo's Prime Minister Abdullah Wood canceled his trip after, after the announcements from the uh, Kosovo Specialist Chambers at The Hague uh, for indicting President Hashim Tachi, as well as Kosovo politician Kadir Vesili with a range of uh, war crimes. However, this is a very strange new situation, I'd say, for several reasons. For starters, this, there has never been an indictment against an acting president in history. Also, the specialist chambers did not just accuse President Hodge of war crimes. They also accused him of repeated efforts to obstruct and undermine the work of the court. And um, the court's announcement was revealed in a very controversial manner, we, it's important to mention. Usually the prosecutor cannot just disclose the names of the sp suspects until confirmed or denied by the judge. But in this case, they said that they were forced or that they had to, uh, to do that because of the repeated efforts to obstruct and undermine the work of the, of the court. Um, meanwhile, I'd say that the use perception across the Western Balkans has been further um, weakened. France to, uh, France's 2019 veto of a session talks for Albania and North Macedonia vis visa regime for Kosovo, just to mention a few, have already weakened Western Balkans policy trust in the EU. Meanwhile, um, the pandemic has just, you know, uh, further, further uh, weakened this. Um, it is crucial to stress that the more distant the prospect of EU entry or visa liberalization for Kosovo, for instance, the less motivation there is for regional reconciliation as, as well as for judiciary or economic reforms. And in a sense, um, I'm afraid that we're opening the doors to other uh, huge powers such as China and Russia's influence. So in one hand, we have, let's say, um, polit political leaders feeding on nationalistic rhetoric in an attempt to divert attention from real problems such as employment, education, judiciary, and so on. Um, while on the other hand, we have a weakened trust and perception in the EU, which is, in a sense, a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, yeah, for now, this is it in Kosovo and my use on the pandemic. So, thank you, Aldona. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you who are following us either on uh, this Zoom, Zoom sorry, webinar or through the live, uh, live stream on Facebook. Um, in case you have any questions and comments, I really encourage you to uh, type them in the, in the field for uh, questions or uh, in some of the comments on, on Facebook so that we can uh, later on uh, also refer to, to your questions and concerns. Uh, it is true that the Balkans inevitably were hit by the by the pandemic, and this once again, uh, this pandemic showed how how fragile our our system systems are. Sorry, but more importantly, how disciplined we are, and how can, how much can we uh, either obey rules or be responsible for for ourselves. Um, Elections are something that are very common at these times, not only in uh, Kosovo, but also are happening in uh, North Macedonia in a while. They just took place in, uh, in Serbia. So uh, more on this and on the situation will be reflected by Georgia. Uh, so Georgia, I think that whenever you're ready, you can, you can start with your part. Thank you, Stephanie, and hello, everyone. Yes, as you, as you just mentioned, the elections quite marked this end of pandemic, if we can even call it, if we can call this the end of pandemic, because uh, recently we saw the huge outbreak of the of the pandemic. They call it the second peak. So I don't think that we are nearly over uh, when it comes to when it comes to the COVID nineteen, at least here in the Western Balkans or in Serbia. Uh, but during the pandemic, the transitional justice actually saw. Uh, quite deteriorating when it comes to the achieved levels, even though it has never been um, uh, fully 
uh, accepted as, as the state policy. Uh, the role of convicted war criminals is something that has propelled on the agenda during the pandemic, even though they have played already quite significant role in the Serbian public sphere and in the Serbian society. But during the pandemic, besides everyone dealing with the pandemic, with the cases, with the number of ventilators and so forth, oh, actually what we have seen was the electoral campaign that involves uh, convicted war criminals as the leaders of the electoral lists which was not the case before, because uh, yes, we had Vojislav Šešen as an MP in, in, the last, um, in the last mandate in the, in the parliament, but now we had two guys uh, besides Vojislav Šešen, the second was Dragan Veljković, also known as Captain Dragan, who was just uh, served his sentence in the Croatian jail and then uh, arrived in Serbia and then he wanted to run in the elections. Also, the lists were also filled up with people who were convicted war criminals. And then we have four parliamentary lists, out of which one made it into the parliament, who were linked or convicted war criminals. So I think that's pretty much telling about the, the public narrative, but not only the public narrative, about the state of uh, the transitional justice in Serbia at this very moment. Uh, what we have in place is the the, the non-respect of the of the ICTY, who have asked for Vjerica Radeta and Petar Jojic to be indicted for relieving the identity of protected witnesses before the ICTY. Uh, the ruling party in Serbia refused to send them uh, to the ICTY or the mechanism now uh, to have their, their trial there. Uh, when it comes to the role of convicted war criminals, it's not only that they are on the list, but they also support the two ruling parties, the, the Vucic-led SNS and then the socialists. We have former prime minister or higher officials in the army, such as Shainovic, Slivanchonin, uh, and the others who are convicted war criminals and who were on TV in prime time who actually supported these two parties. So I think that when it comes to this revision of 1990s and then the revision of history, it literally flourished during the pandemic because it was the second topic after the, after the COVID situation. And then we actually could see how the new reality looks like. Um, this narrative level also reflects the institutional lack of political will when it comes to transitional justice or dealing with the past, more generally speaking. Uh, I will only concentrate on the judiciary, even though transitional justice is more complex. Uh, judiciary is simply missing the political will to conduct any war crime trial or any war crimes prosecution uh, thoroughly, deeply, and widely. Uh, I'll just give you one number. Since the adoption of the National Strategy on War Crimes Prosecution in 2016, which is a part of the Chapter 23 of the Action Plan for Chapter 23 for uh, EU-Serbia negotiations, uh, there have been more than 2,500 pre-investigation or investigation cases. So the cases which are in this phase, only 21 confirmed indictment since 2016. So uh, we have a huge number of cases which are in the first phase and we don't see confirmed indictments. Out of these 21 confirmed indictments, 18 have been transferred from the Bosnian uh, prosecutor. So only three are actually genuinely the work of the Serbian war crimes prosecutor. Uh, the political will is lacking also on this institutional level when it comes to the support to these positions. We haven't had a, a prosecutor, war crimes prosecutor for over a year. Uh, we don't have, they don't have resources, they don't have the backup of the police who is going to do, to conduct the investigation only instead of, along with them. And then I also think that last but not least, what is missing when it comes to the judicial part is the lack of regional cooperation and coordination. The wars necessarily implicated many sides, and in order to have a, a proper investigation, in order to build up the indictment, you need the active judicial cooperation between Serbian, Kosovan, Croatian, Bosnian, etc., prosecutors and police. That is missing terribly, at least when it comes to the, the prosecution of war crimes. Uh, there are many problems when it comes to them as well. Out of these indicted cases, all of them are mid-ranked or lower-ranked, um, both either in army or policemen or para paramilitary forces. So we don't see highly ranked 
either military or police uh, persons who are tried before the courts in Serbia. It's almost impossible to, to have someone who is highly ranked to end up before the court. All those who end up are actually either members of paramilitary troops or middle to lower ranked people. So I think that it really shows what's the state of, of um of transitional justice in Serbia, at least when it comes to at, key, at least when it comes to judicial protection, and then the judicial the, the judicial system as such, which is which is meant to deliver justice to victims. Um, last but not least, this is a state strategy which actually supports both parts that I've been talking about. So both the promotion in public space of convicted war criminals and the lack of and the lack of. Uh, war crimes prosecution. Uh, we have the Ministry of Defense that publishes memoirs of uh, convicted generals from Bosnia War or Kosovo War. Uh, we have a state narrative that said that says that Serbia has not taken part in the wars in 1990s, and thus we have a simulation of transitional justice in Serbia. That would be my conclusion. We have a simulation of tra transitional justice in Serbia that is not delivering. Uh, justice to victims, nor prosecuting the ones who have committed crimes in 1990s. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia, as well. Uh, it's been a nice reflection. I mean, not so nice events, but it was a good reflection in order for us to see where we stand now and what should the next steps be. I think that the in, in the next circle of questions, we can also reflect a little bit on what should the next steps be? Because we are also talking about the international um, cooperation at times like this, and also how much the pandemic has slowed down the process of um, international cooperation. And we know that, um, especially in this region, uh, we cannot make any significant steps forward um, if we lack any, any part of the international cooperation. Um, so thank you once again. And... Um, in that direction, we also have Mario Majic, who um, is going to speak a lot about um, transitional justice. And when we were preparing the session, he said, like, depending on how much the other speakers will say, I can either speak five minutes or 50 minutes. So now we're going to see what Mario has to add up on what has already been brought up in the discussion and uh, what are the next remarks going to be. Uh, go ahead, Mario, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm not going to speak a lot. Uh, I'm going to say my points and then uh, make sure that we leave enough time for, for discussion and, and questions. Um, I do have two corrections, uh, though, for, for things that were said so far. One uh, very uh, crucial and the other of less importance. The crucial one is when you announce Georgia, you said he's from Belgrade. He's not. He's from Chachak. Um, so to, to, to correct that. And uh, second, um, um, uh, Thatcher is not the first sitting president to face indictment uh, for war crimes. We had a case of uh, Sloboda Milosevic in May 1999, and we had a case of Omar al-Bashir uh, in, in 2008 under the le leadership of Prosecutor Luis uh, Moreno Campo. Um, so it's not without uh, precedent. Um, I, I have uh, five points uh, brief um, about transitional justice in the region and one point about uh, reconciliation that I would like to make as uh, as also the the uh, inputs for our discussion. Um, the first one is an issue that uh, Georgia touched um, on already, and that is uh, um, a very low level of regional cooperation in in criminal matters when it comes to war crimes uh, prosecution specifically. Um, as Georgia mentioned already, there is uh, some level of cooperation. Um, and these uh, mostly relating to, to these cases that Bosnia transfers to Croatia or Serbia um, because uh, uh, Bosnian prosecution office and the court were actually doing the best job um, in the region and particularly compared to Croatia and Serbia uh, when it comes to, to uh, preparing indictments and prosecuting uh, war crimes. Unfortunately, the situation is such that uh, mostly Croat and Serb perpetrators are not um, um, accessible to the Bosnian 
judiciary. So they have to uh, basically transfer the, the cases to Croatia or to Serbia to have them prosecuted there or hope that they might get prosecuted there. Uh, one issue there, Georgia covered very well, and um, it relates to uh, cases being transferred, but then the prosecution office in Serbia or in Croatia not doing anything on it for uh, for a, a long period of time or ever. And um, the other is that there are um, mechanisms that are not very judicial, but more political that the countries use when they basically oppose those prosecutions. We have a very recent case of Mia Jelic, um, uh, a Croat uh, uh, that uh, the Bosnian prosecution office um, um, uh, indicted for, for crimes committed against uh, uh, Bosniaks in um, in the, the Croatian-Bosnian uh, conflict. And because he lives in Croatia, the, the case um, is basically being transferred to Croatia. But there is a uh, there is an issue that Croatia basically does not recognize that um, uh, crimes of that level, crimes against humanity, joint criminal enterprise, and those sorts of things took place. Um, and, and there have been cases before, um, uh, for example, when our current president, uh, Zoran Milanovic, um, uh, adopted a conclusion uh, when he was prime minister uh, that basically said if Bosnia continues transferring these sorts of cases, accusing Croatia for its participation in the war um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, basically we will never allow Bosnia to enter the EU. Um, so there are these political tools that uh, Serbia and, and Croatia primarily use to basically push back uh, about what Bosnian uh, judiciary is doing in, in terms of prosecution of war crimes. At the same time, I think Georgia covered very, very well the situation in Serbia. And just to add a fact that no high-level positioned uh, officer from Yana, from Yugoslav People's Party, has been held accountable in Serbia. That has not happened to date. Um, in Croatia, we have seen a steady um, uh, a slowdown of prosecution process of, uh, after Croatia became a member state of the EU. Um, the, the investments before in prosecutions were largely um, motivated by, um, by the negotiations process, not because uh, the Croatian political leadership, either left or right, um, believed in the value of uh, the process of establishing uh, justice. Um, the, so the, the the regional cooperation and the the Croatia and Serbia is as basically problematic players uh, uh, hindering the the potential of development of transitional justice in the region are the first two points. The third point I wanted to make is that um, uh, we constantly see not only in election times but uh, specifically in election times, but uh, we consistently see the denialist narratives are propagated by the political leaders in the region. And I really don't want to discriminate against anybody here um, because it really um, applies to, to all political uh, leaders in, in the countries throughout the Balkans. They all have uh, uh, more or less denialist or relativist narratives that they propagate and promote, even after um, uh, some things are established in court or, or previously have been established by the ICTY, uh, they show that they have no regard for that and will continue with their uh, narratives regardless of the, the established facts. Um, uh, that leads me to the four point of um, a low take up of established facts by society because they're partly um, due to political leaders propagating these denialist narratives, um, but it's not only it's not only because of that. Uh, there is a lot more in the mix, the education systems, the media, um, the, the pundits and, and people sharing political opinions who are not political leaders, but, uh, uh, but share those views and, and so on. And then just the fact that it's not always easy for people to recognize um, um, the, the, the crimes committed by, by their side um, in that sense. Um, and the final point related to transitional justice, I want to say that, uh, in my opinion, at least, the European Union's approach to transitional justice in the region has been consistently and reliably flawed. Um, this, uh, this was seen the results as well, um, but we see it in, in, in several 
uh, facts. I'm not going to go into into all of that, but um, just the the timeliness of when the European Commission started thinking about the the strategy for transitional justice was very very late. Uh, the fact that they didn't have um, or think of stronger mechanisms after the ICTY is a huge gap in in their policy. So the ICTY was working out well in terms of pushing countries to cooperate with it because it was a uh, um, very much related to the uh, to the negotiations process. However, local prosecutions are not seen as having the same level of uh, prominence, let's say, in the EU accession process, and and that is ca- uh, causing uh, um, less, um, let's say, incentives for uh, political leaders in the region to engage with this. Um, third, it's just um, um, a great, great mistake that the EU did in this regard with Croatia that it never communicated about and never opened up about. Croatia was admitted into the EU um, without uh, having a a reliable system of prosecution of war crimes. It never convinced um, any reasonable uh, observer that, uh, that it really developed a system that's able to prosecute these crimes without bias and more complex crimes engaging um, uh, uh, also having to do with criminal uh, with command I'm sorry responsibility um, uh, another thing is that uh, we we saw that uh, the, the judgment for joint criminal enterprise that a uh, Croatian political leadership in the 90s led by um, the wartime uh, president and, and peacetime thief uh, Franjo Tudjman um, that uh, Croatian leadership just uh, uh, basically refused uh, to acknowledge that their determination of the um, ICTY and there is nothing the EU can can do about that. Um, uh, a mistake was also if the EU did not want Croatia to perform better uh, on this before becoming part of the EU, it should have think uh, thought about um, post-accession measures and it didn't. And now it's um, uh, the EU, I understand, is in a very complicated situation where it wishes to ask of something from Serbia, but Serbia can just point to, to Croatia and say, they didn't have to do it, why should we? Um, and, and that's an issue that's uh, going to stay with us uh, for as long as the EU does not critically reflect on its TJ policies and, as I said, consistent and rely, uh, reliable failures in that respect um, and does not address them head on. And the last point I want to make, um, but um, uh, not having to do with uh, with justice, but more with reconciliation, um, is just a notion uh, or, or my opinion that we went further in reconciliation when it comes to international level. So when it comes to political leaderships reconciling country to country, then we did internally within within countries. When you compare how reconciled Croatia and Serbia are, and then go to the ground and see how reconciled people are in parts of Vojvodina or in parts of Slavonia, Banovina or Kordun, uh, or uh, the, in Dalmatia, you see a, a huge, huge difference in that regard. And um, this is part of a problem that we think that uh, justice and reconciliation are uh, just the high level issues. They're not. They're community issues to the core. Um, modern democratic systems, uh, modern democratic states need um, reliable, uh, trustworthy systems of administering justice. And what makes them reliable and trustworthy is that people trust them. Um, we cannot have stable justice systems if they don't penetrate the public opinion in a way that people actually find them reliable. And then if you're going to um, rig your justice systems uh, to to defend um, uh, people that you as leader consider war heroes when they're war criminals, then you're going to rig them a little bit um, not to to prosecute, um, not to get yourself prosecuted or other other people in your party for corruption. Then of course you're ruining the the justice system for everybody else. So I'll stop here and and uh, we'll continue with the discussion. I guess on the basis of questions as well. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Maria, as well. I would like to encourage you once again to ask your questions in the questions and answers field you have at the bottom of the 
of this Zoom webinar. Um, so far, we have one question, which is for Georgia, and I think that it would be fair to ask that question first and then go with, with some of the remarks um, I made while, uh, while hearing you speak. So um, it says, to what Georgia talked about, that war criminals are promoted in the public space. Are there any counter narratives that expose those war criminals? How much are these narratives heard or allowed? Um, is there a strong public opinion on those specific individuals who are now who are now promoted? Sorry, I think uh, Georgia. Whenever you're ready. Thank you, thank you, Stephanie. I saw the question. Uh, I want to just I'll first answer the question and then something that Mario said about, which is a topic I also pretty much like, is the EU's role. But we can come back later on 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 that, and then I'll just concentrate on the question here now briefly. Yes, there is a counter narrative, which is usually not coming from the institutions, but from the civil society, be it uh, youth organization, human rights organizations, or something else. It's only coming from the civil society. And then we have seen the situations quite recently that, for instance, Youth Initiative for Human Rights tried to block, to prevent people convicted or criminals speaking up at the panels, including the, the panels of the ruling party when they were beaten up afterwards. So there is a, a civic resistance to the uh, well-established now narrative about the uh, the 1990s, about the, we haven't committed crimes, it was the others, etc. I think that there is, but uh, and I also think that it's important, it has been in Belgrade in place even since the 1990s, which is the movement uh, Women in Black, which have been standing against uh, the war back then in, in Croatia and in Bosnia and later on in Kosovo, and now we have the second generation, I would call it like that, of the civil movement who protests against those narratives. But unfortunately, it's only coming from, uh, from the civil society. There are some political leaders, even though they are hugely marginalized on the political scene. The very fact that I can tell you is that after 2020 parliamentary elections, that won't be a single MP who will tell in the Serbian parliament that, for instance, Srebrenica is a genocide. There won't be a single MP. And we did have that between 2016 and 2020. So I think that the, the society in general is going due to the narrative. And then there are many layers in that. It's not only the political elite, as Mario said, it's also the education, the media, the, the, the general society narrative that builds up on that, uh, about the culture of impunity and then lack of justice thereafter for the victims. So I think that uh, the, 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 the response that is coming from Serbia is unfortunately not sufficient to oppose the mainstreamed impunity and the, 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 the promotion of convicted war criminals, but there is some. That would be, that would be just for the question. Thank you so much. In case you want to add up on what you already mentioned to answer to Mario, you can also do that now or right after uh, Lona, because uh, my next question was for her, so maybe we can um, add up uh, once once she answers. So um, Lona is also working a lot with uh, young people, and she has been working in the field of education, of corruption in education, and she was also following the student protests and what the students were fighting for in the, in the last period. So uh, I, my question would be in, in relation to that. What are the young people's standings on the recent happenings? And do you see any ways or any mechanisms that they can use uh, at this particular challenging times in order to uh, not only raise their voice, but to show what the values that young people ask for are? And um, if, uh, if there is anything uh, currently happening that you would like to share on in that direction, maybe. Just please unmute the, the microphone. Aulona, un unmute the microphone because we can't hear you. Okay, sorry. Stephanie. Now it works. Okay. Uh, I would also, before before going on with your question, I would like to add what happened uh, in Kosovo a couple, of, yeah, a couple of months ago. On a TV interview, uh, Kurdish former political advisor, President Gashi, which is a well-known uh, human rights activist, said that among other things that um, all parties involved in the course of Serbia uh, conflict or war um, should acknowledge the wrongdoings and, and move on. However, he was then humiliated, he was blackmailed on social media, 
And then eventually he was also uh, dismissed by, uh, by Kurde. And I think this is something uh, very important because it shows that um, our society is still not ready to talk about such things. We're still not ready to actually, you know, actually we do talk a lot about transitional justice. We talk a lot about reconciliation. But when it comes down to um, doing something about it, uh, we don't really go forward. And I do believe that one of the reasons for that is that because it's not popular, you don't get votes from that. So this, and this is not what our politicians want. Um, regarding young people and their mechanisms, um, I'd say that right now it's too early to get a good idea what they're feeling right now and what they can do. However, I know that um, I can sense and it's obvious that young people in Kosovo are, 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 are feeling let down because they voted for someone else and then um, someone else uh, took power. So basically you vote for someone and then um, your vote is being misused and we have a completely different government. And but regarding what just happened with uh, a thoughtless indictment, um, I'm not sure about it. It's, it's mixed feelings, I guess. And um, we're still processing it. So th thank you, Aldona. Uh, yeah, we're about to see, I hope, some uh, positive attitudes and also young people who will be determined to see the, the values they have. Because from what we have been sharing so far, not only in today's discussion, but also in the period where we work together, uh, it's easy for us to notice that the values we have, the values we require, are kind of different from the national authorities we have and kind of more progressive than uh, what we are kind of uh, used to seeing in our everyday life. And I'm really happy for that, but it's also a big challenge and burden to make that change happen. But it's good when we have each other to support uh, and uh, when we have someone to, to share our vision with. Uh, I can agree that young people feel let down because recently we also made one research in uh, North Macedonia. It was actually in May last year. Uh, and the results were kind of uh, disappointing because young people don't really believe that the national institutions care about their interests and they don't feel like they have power to do something uh, in order to make a change happen. And that's uh, probably because we are used to see democracy as a process which we are only spectators of and that we're sitting on the side and seeing how things are going to support um, sort themselves out uh, rather than a process where we are uh, integral part and where we can do our things and use the mechanisms we have. So maybe when we talk about education in the future, we can also reflect on that. In the meanwhile, we have um, another question, uh, which I think it's for, for Aulona and Georgia. Both of you, uh, I think you will have um, many things to, to add upon this. So it says that in the meeting organized uh, between Bucic and Tachi um, uh, in the White House set for last week, sorry, uh, it has been cancelled, as we know. The EU was not part of it, but belgrade pristina dialogue seemed to be in a dreadlock before. Is this cancellation, due to obvious reasons, a rollback to the peace process, and how is it perceived within the respective societies in Kosovo and Serbia? So I think that now uh, Georgia can give us a reflection on this and then we can continue to Lona. And, and I already see the third question we have. So I think we'll have enough time to answer everything. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, now first I'll go back to, to what Mario was saying about the um, EU's role uh, in, his, in, in his first uh, part about the I think we have um, problems with the connection because I can see Aluna and Mario. But uh, EU accession. Uh, Georgia, could you please start from the beginning of the answer because there was um, a problem with the connection. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, so, it's good. Uh, thank you. So uh, I. I said that I would go back to what was Mario saying about the EU's approach in the region when it comes to transitional justice. I absolutely agree that it's fundamentally important uh, that transitional justice is part of the uh, accession process of all Western Balkan six, 
uh, even more than it was the, in the case of Croatia. But I disagree when it comes to the modalities or mechanisms that EU has it in hands, is in hands uh, to use when it comes to the implementation of transitional justice mechanisms in the Balkans. Um, I honestly don't see uh, the, the, the strong mechanism that you mentioned after the ICTY that EU could put in place when it comes to its Western Balkan strategy, even though I would have liked to see it. But I don't think it's realistic to be put in place uh, as a part of stabilization association process or something similar. Uh, I think there was a problem again. Yeah, maybe we can wait for for several seconds and then yeah, I don't think we have to. But however, I think that Aulona, uh, you could give your your views on this, and then we continue with Georgia one once we have him back. Just make make sure you unmute. Yeah, good. Um. Well, okay. Let me just read it. Let me know. Okay. Uh, well, it's it's more complicated. It was made, it was coming to that. Um, Tachi was en route uh, when when the uh, KSC statement was issued. So then he came back. However, what I'm not so sure about is um, why our Prime Minister Poti had to come back. I do believe that as Prime Minister, he should have um, represented Kosovo at the White House. And then, um, then okay, George is here. Does George, George want to continue where you left or? No, no, please go on and then I'll come back, no worries. Okay. Um, the, the course of Serbia, the Pristina Belgrade dialogue uh, wasn't that long before. Um, and yes, it is due to obvious reasons. However, what we can see now is that it is perceived as a war between the US and the EU. At least that's how it's perceived in, uh, in, uh, in the local media in Kosovo. Um, and also, I think it's important to say, to say that uh, while many people would be happy for Tachi to for President Tachi to face trial over uh, corruption allegations and so on, uh, accusing him for war crimes uh, is not something that many people agree or believe that he has committed. So um, I do think that it's important that uh, we take a step back, both parties, and um, rethink what we really want from the dialogue. Some concrete uh, measures that we want uh, out of it and have uh, a unified team that represents, uh, for instance, both Kosovo and Serbia. But in Kosovo until now, we did not have a unified um, team representing the country in negotiations, right? So now it is a good opportunity for Kosovo to do that and uh, have one voice and uh, think uh, what we want from it. However, as I, was, as I said before, I do think that uh, the people are still processing what just happened and we'll have to wait a few more days to see how we really feel about all this. Thank you. Now that we have Georgia back, maybe we can continue uh, where we stopped. Uh, I don't know where I have stopped and, or what you have heard, but I'll, then I'll just be brief. Uh, it was something that uh, the first thing I wanted to refer what Mario was saying about the uh, EU's approach in the region when it comes to transitional justice. Whereas I do agree when it comes to EU's role and approach when it comes to transitional justice, it's, it's very much needed and it's of fundamental importance that it is a part of the uh, EU accession process of all Western Balkan six. Um, the part where I don't disagree, where I disagree or where I don't agree very much is that the EU should have invented a new mechanism to replace the ICTY or to have something in place that would go further. I don't think the EU has in its tools something similar or could have the, the, the strength, the, the political pressure to enforce it 
say it is Serbia Kosovo case or somewhere else. So I don't think that it's it's realistic. Where I see the EU's role is the further support for local prosecution, for the enhanced criminal cooperation in judicial matters, what you talked about, and we both agree that there is a lack of cooperation and then the, what Bosnian prosecution does and then what Serbian or Croatian prosecution and courts do not implement is a problem. And I think that's that's the place where EU can step in and be more um, stringent, more strict when it comes to uh, measuring uh, the implementation of, for instance, the national strategy on war crimes prosecution as we have it as a part of Chapter 23. Chapter 23, as we all know by now, is the, the one dealing with the rule of law and, and uh, war crimes trials are part of that chapter. So I think that that's the, the, the place for the European Union to, to play part in. I don't think that the U European Union has any other uh, possibility to reconcile us, to deliver more justice, or to do anything else when it comes to transitional justice. Um, I just don't see it as a feasible, as a feasible way to, to move forward. I think it, it has come time to be it on us to deal with the, with the transitional justice, of course, with the additional pressure and support from the European Union. And now I come on this question that you had about the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue. I mean, I would agree with uh, what what I've heard from Aulionis part. I don't know if, if I missed something when I was absent, but in brief, briefly, I also agree that it's a, it's a big play between the US and the EU, and then it's usually misfortunate for us here in the Balkans when the big play um, and I don't think that there is a, an honest will on either sides to negotiate and to actually uh, try to bring closer in the first place societies and then both Serbia and Kosovo on the institutional level. I think that uh, I don't see that political will and I don't think that uh, the dialogue will bring it. But personally, I must say that I'm happy that the Brussels dialogue is resumed, that the, that the dialogue under the auspices of the European Union is resumed because it seemed more predictable, more um, the, the, the dialogue that where we know coordinates where we move on. And um, I think that it can, it can deliver a piece because I also think that the crucial thing that we miss about the dialogue is the non-inclusiveness of it. We don't have uh, huge parts of societies, both in Serbia and Kosovo, that are uh, parts whose voice is heard in the dialogue. And then if we want to implement uh, any agreement, whatever the deal is, it will depend on the people who need to live that life, who need to implement that agreement. So I think without uh, the inclusion of significant parts of population of different actors, both in Serbia and Kosovo, we won't have any, any, any progress in that regard. Thank you, Georgia. It was good that we had no interruptions this time, but I, uh, but I agree that some of the, of the things that we should look into in the near future are, are those brought up by you now and um i will skip one question because i think that mario can uh give us his opinion on uh what is the role of foreign especially non-eu actors uh regarding reconciliation especially the role of china and russia we're not really used to discuss about these things or so far in our discussions we haven't been opening uh this part of the of the discussion so i think that it could be interesting to um talk a little bit about the role of uh, non-EU actors regarding uh, reconciliation, especially in the region when we know that we have the Regional Youth Reconciliation and Cooperation Office. And maybe later on, Aulona can, can uh, build up on this as well. Even though Croatia is not really uh, the, one of the main parts in, in this Regional Youth Cooperation Office, but I think that you could, you could tell us at least is the direction of what we see the right one and what should the role of the other non-EU actors be in this reconciliation process? Thanks. I, uh, I just want to briefly refer to the, the previous topic. I, um, um, uh, I think there was a misunderstanding between me and Georgia because I didn't suggest a new mechanism. What I was saying was that uh, the EU treated the ICTY in cooperation with the ICTY as highly important in the negotiations, whereas the, the local prosecution side wasn't treated relevantly. When it comes to Croatia, there was fundamentally two, two requests in that respect. One, to move the cases to the four big courts in four big towns, because the, the, 
the quality of prosecutions and the level in, in lower courts was just uh, terrible. Um, and, and there was one request and Croatia mostly, um, mostly did that. The other one was basically the existence of the strategy. <laughs> Give me an hour, I can write the strategy. It's going to be just as convincing. Um, that's that's simply not enough. Um, so my argument was that uh, not that um, the EU should have a new ICTY or some other mechanism, but that it should treat other issues in transitional justice space as relevantly as it treated um, the, the cooperation of the states with the ICTY. And it's not. So that, that was my argument. And when it comes to the, um, to the EU dialogue um, and, and the, the um, uh, uh, Pristina Belgrade um, uh, dialogue facil- facilitated by the EU, um, I just wanted to say a few things um, of, of personal opinion, kind of. Um, I do think it's beneficial to have the United States in the mix when it comes to this dialogue. Partly because of the great um, role that the United States had um, in the, the, the late 90s, early 2000s uh, around the conflict in Kosovo. Partly because the EU embarrassed itself in Kosovo with EU leaks. And um, it's important that it's, uh, um, that it's conducted in a way that actually gives confidence to, to people on the ground as well. Unfortunately, we now have the current administration in the U.S. that wanted to make this a quick deal, probably for Trump's campaigning purpose rather than the benefit of of people in in Kosovo and and in Serbia. Um, I'm not sure that what we have now is going to enable the dialogue to to proceed or we're going to have to wait for the the context to change somewhat. I also didn't think it's a good option to have the dialogue with, between uh, Vucic and Hoti because I think it would raise a number of concerns about Hoti's legitimacy, um, not in the least because he's supported partly by Srpska Lista, which responds to Vucic. So you would have someone with a total legitimacy on one side, Vucic, and someone with questionable legitimacy on another side of the table. I don't think that's a strong basis for, for negotiations because it's, again, it's not just about the high level, uh, putting a, a signature on the paper kind of thing. It's also about people actually having faith that, uh, that the dialogue process addressed the key issues, that it took their grievances into account and so on. And uh, I, in that respect, I trust much more the EU, whatever it's like, than the current American administration, which wanted to have nothing to do basically with the substance of a deal and just wanted the deal probably for their political purposes. Um, when it comes to the role of other, um, um, other non-EU actors when it comes to, to reconciliation in the region, I don't really see it. Um, I, don't, I don't see the, the role of, uh, of China and Russia apart from um, having negative roles in, in, in um, spreading the kind of values that go against the values on which we're also basing the, the ideas when it comes to transitional justice and, um, and reconciliation and democratic development that is actually needed for uh, that you you cannot have justice if you don't have uh, democracy to an extent you cannot have a reconciliation as a social process if you don't have um, some level of democratic political culture that uh, where where people are used to engaging in public matters and and talking about that reconciliation is not a process that uh lasts for a certain number of days and then it's done. It's a, it's a social process that needs to really penetrate deeply in the society and that, um, that is basically a democratic uh, kind of uh, um, uh, democratic notion. So it's, it's uh, in itself a necessarily democratic process. So just, just on that level, um, I would say that uh, China and Russia can only impact that negatively with their policies towards the Balkans as they as they are, but it's not a topic where, where I can say I know uh, much more. Thank you, Mario. And in this direction, I would also like to add up that, uh, I mean, I, I completely agree that reconciliation is not a project or a process that lasts for a particular time, but it's uh, a mindset and it's a set of values that we all need to carry. And the easiest way to do that, I mean, that's 
most most certainly not the easiest way, but the most secure way to do that is through the educational system. So we must um, we we need to be sure that we are raising young people who are going to uh, believe in a reconciliation and who are uh, willingly going to be part of that process of process of understanding the past and overcoming it together with uh, their peers and the older generations, I would say. Uh, and uh, another thing, and that sh- should be probably the last question because we're five minutes until the end of the discussion. Uh, it's a very interesting question. And it's also about when we reflect to what the older, older generations do or what we uh, see and who we learn from. So the question, that it's um, more specifically about the Serbian situation, but I think that it could be easily transferred to any situation in the Balkans. It says that having in mind that the Serbian president is often violating the constitution, how can someone ever hope to see a change in the justice system and especially in the transitional justice? And this could be, as I mentioned, transferred very easily to any other situation in the Balkans because our values, the values of young people and the values of what we are trying to achieve are very different from what from what our national institutions serve us and what um, the people who should be respecting the these values most are really doing with their uh, with their everyday um, everyday acting. So uh, this could be kind of the wrap up question for for all of you. Uh, you can make a short concept for a minute or two, and then um, tell us how can we make a change when everything we see is kind of very different from what we are striving to achieve. Um, Aulona or Georgia, whoever of you uh, wants can go first and then the other one and then we have uh, Mario. So um, whoever feels ready. Yeah, Georgia. I can, I, I can start very briefly. Um, yeah, Mario, thank you for clarification. I mean, this pretty much clarifies the, the EU's approach and the EU's position. And with that, I can also agree. I agree with fully and completely when it comes to when it comes to what the EU should do when it comes to transitional justice in the Balkans in post, not only post-COVID, but post-ICTY world. So I think that's a, that's a fundamental question definitely for all Western Balkan cities. Um, the question was about the, um, uh, I'll just pick up 30 seconds on, on, on uh, the last question about Russia and China. Usually we don't see them as, a member in the dialogue when it comes to Serbia and Kosovo. Russia, to a certain extent, of course, due to its interest, and we all know the stories about Georgia, Ukraine, Crimea, etc. But I will just raise a point recently about China, who is usually per- perceived only as the uh, investor, loans, Belt and Road, etc. Uh, the Serbian government issued a statement about the Hong-, Hong Kong policy of the Chinese government, which has never happened in last eight years since the SNS came into power. I think even though we don't see that as a as something super significant, I think the changing narrative, not only about the ventilator during the pandemic, but also the statement about Hong Kong is really something that can structurally change the policy here in the Balkans, in, in Serbia concretely, when it comes to China. I don't see the implications yet when it comes to Serbia Kosovo dialogue, but I wouldn't neglect completely China because we usually don't see China as an active part concretely in this space, in, in this case, as, uh, in, in, in Serbia Kosovo dialogue. And now I come to your, uh, to your question about uh, the violation of constitution or the answer of young people. Um, I would disagree, but we don't have more time when you always say our values, values of young people. Values of young people are actually quite problematic, at least in Serbia, but I would say in Southeast Europe in general, as the Friedrich Hebert uh, study says. Um, there are small oases, small islands of progressive uh, people, be it young or a bit more mature here in Serbia, that actually try to oppose the system. And I see the, the hope for change in there. I think that uh, with uh, those progressive forces in our society, and if we do regionally, there can something be achieved. Uh, there can be a change, and there can be something that can be meaningfully 
the outcome of the, of this process. Uh, the situation does look quite bad uh, if you if you look at least uh, here in Serbia, but it's pretty much similar in the throughout the Western Balkans when it comes to uh, democracy. When it comes to uh, we spoke about transitional justice, uh, we can speak about other areas. That I don't think that we can if we can uh, have this race to the bottom. But um, I, I believe, and I'll finish with that, that uh, the, the main hope for the future are these islands of young people, progressive people who bring the change and who force the change from within, from the bottom to, the, to, to, to up. So I think that that's the only hope we have also when it comes to transitional justice. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Aldona, you may uh, continue. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, I agree with what Georgia just said, and yes, way in line with what he just said, that young people are the one who, who push the changes. I think that's where the role of the civil society comes in. The civil society has to use its, all its uh, infrastructure and connections, be that the international community, uh, its network with the embassies and so on, to, to, help, uh, to help make all these necessary changes, as well as advocate um, in more of a structural manner to the to all the stakeholders. Um, that being said, for instance, right now, uh, all, I mean, uh, the organizations that focus on the education system in Kosovo, uh, we are actually pressuring the Prime Minister of Kosovo, uh, Prime Minister Vote, to dismiss the Minister of Education and um, Vice Minister of Education due to ethical reasons. So this is, you know, like small things that you can do each one in their respective fields. However, it is very important that, uh, that the civil society um, encourages the youngsters to, to go on, to protest, to be vocal, and, and um, try to voice their opinions and show them that actually change can be, uh, can be, can be achieved. Thank you, Olona. I agree with both of you, and I'm sure that Mario will agree with us that the critical minds and the progressive minds are kind of the less percentage of our surrounding. But we, I think, as people who come from the civil society sector and people who personally believe in these values have the uh, burden, I would say, to continue with our work. And especially at this challenging times, not only when we have political crisis, but also when we have social crisis uh, in general. So, Mario, uh, you will be the one who will wrap up today's discussion to, together with the uh, last words from your side. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, the, the way uh, this question is phrased, it says, how can someone even hope to see a change in the justice system? Well, hope is more or less the, the, the only thing we have left in, in that regard. So that, that they cannot take away from us. Everything else uh, they, they might be able to. Um, I, I, um, well, when it comes to the, the social change that we have to see in order to get there, I agree with that notion. I think the, the time when uh, our states were very weak and the international community was very strong is, uh, is behind us. Uh, so we, we can um, no longer really expect that um, um, you know, something like uh, like that is going to be imposed uh, on us from outside. No, it's we we need to develop that. And uh, um, what seems to be happening is that we just not can I cannot get lucky in, in terms of having responsible political leaders who would um, invest in building democratic institutions, including the. Uh, including a strong independent justice system in our country, so that is going to have to be a result of a um, of a social change. Um, I, I do think that people who who think like us have this um, civic responsibility to work on that. But uh, I think when it comes to the specific issue of justice, um, that that people throughout the region are are actually hungry for it. Um, the, the problematic thing is that I don't often understand, um, what I mentioned earlier in this discussion is that, uh, you cannot have a justice system that works great, but then does not work when it comes to prosecution of war crimes or does not work when it comes to corruption. It's either independent, unbiased, professional, and trustworthy, or it is not. So, um... I think also the the people who um, who are, I believe, a, a majority throughout the region and want to live in in countries that have 
systems able to facilitate justice um, in our societies. I think most people want that, but it's on us also to be critical for, towards ourselves. Um, people who um, who express similar opinions like us have been um, working in the Balkans in the, for for the past thirty years very loudly um, with with extraordinary commitment, and they only got this far. So I think we also have to um, think much more about how to work more with people on the the grassroots level. That we have to be critical of the way civil societies conduct themselves, chasing projects that then you implement in capital cities. That's that's not the way it's supposed to work. We, we have to find ways to really engage and primarily engage with those that we think think differently than we do. Um, it's it's um, We're not in a moment where there's so many of us that just gathering people who think like us in rooms can, can produce a change. It won't. Um, we have to go out in, 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 in that regard and uh, um, and work on the grassroots level uh, with young people, but with everybody else as well. And as I said, primarily, I think with those that are, um, we think want to see as a result um, modern, democratic, stable states, but may disagree with us on um, on many other issues that uh, even has to do with web values. We need to engage in those sorts of dialogues and instead of closing this on a note that's critical towards our governments or or the eu or any other player i would actually close it on this note of um us having to to look um towards ourselves and be a little more critical uh towards what it is that we're doing and how we can um contribute more to ensuring the social change uh that we want to see Thank you so much. Uh, and I would like to say one big thank you to, to all of us who were following us on uh, Facebook and through this Zoom webinar. Um, I would like to thank for the support from the International Institute for Peace, Austrian Institute for International Affairs, and to the Renner Institute. Um, and once again, we had one very quality discussion with many healthy arguments and things that we should take into consideration, not only uh, in what we do and how we act, but also in the projects we create and in the um, directions where, where we invest our energy, I would say. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, listening to your discussion. It was a pleasure moderating it. And uh, I would like to wish you a um, nice day, nice, uh, nice several hours from the day, and to continue following the activities of this uh, working group, I would say. Thank you once again until the next discussion.